Hi, I'm Mike Hawkins, District Fisheries Biologist with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. This presentation provides an overview of the Anglers Bay Shoreline Restoration Project on Big Spirit Lake in Dickinson County. The Aquatic Habitat and Forestry Management Plan presented here is a collaborative effort, and I'd like to recognize Mark Gulick and Chris LaRue with the Iowa DNR Wildlife Bureau, and Aaron Wright and Amber Thompson uh, from the Iowa DNR Forestry Program for their work on this plan. We've also received valuable input for, on the project from the Dickinson County Clean Water Alliance, the Spirit Lake Protective Association, and the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation. A copy of the Forest Stewardship Plan and Aquatic Habitat Plan can be found at the link on the bottom of the screen. Spirit Lake is Iowa's largest natural lake at about 5,700 acres. The majority, or 68%, of the lake shoreline is in private ownership. The project proposed in this plan will impact approximately 5,000 feet of shoreline highlighted here, making up about one-sixth of the public shoreline on the lake. The shoreline we're addressing in this project is framed by Sandbar Slough to the north and Hale Slough to the south. This photograph, taken prior to the public acquisition of the property, uh, shows the extent of woody vegetation and trees along the shoreline and highlights the extensive emergent aquatic plant beds found on the shoreline. Uh, these emergent aquatic plants, like cattail and bulrush, are plants that are rooted in the lake bed but grow up and out of the water. This aerial photo shows the same portion of the Spirit Lake Lake Shore uh, with the area highlighted in yellow that became public in 2006. Local fundraising contributed the largest share of the funds needed to make the acquisition of this property possible. In the large stand of hard stem bulrushes and other aquatic plants along the shoreline were identified as a major reason to protect this property. Some prayer restoration has occurred on the property along with some wetland reconstructions that can be seen in this photo. Anglers Bay on Big Spirit Lake is well studied with historic aquatic plant surveys conducted from 1897 through 2007 by some of Iowa's leading aquatic plant experts. 54 aquatic plant species have been found during all of these surveys, making this bay one of the most diverse and ecologically important in our state. Most visibly, the hard stem bulrushes in Anglers Bay make up one of the largest remaining stands of this plant in our state. Unfortunately, the number of species occurring in Anglers Bay has been declining through time, with the last survey in 2006 and 7 finding only 28 aquatic plant species. Of these 28, at least four were not native to the lake. Although this is one of the most intact large lake aquatic ecosystems in Iowa, its ecology is threatened. In the most recent study of the bay in 2006 and 2007, Phillips outlined six threats to the aquatic plants and diversity of this area. These threats are pretty well known and guide current management activities on Spirit Lake and many of the other natural lakes in the region. The first is the maintenance of stable water levels. Several of the imperiled aquatic plant species in Anglers Bay, like hard stem bulrush, have to have periods of low water to allow for their seeds to germinate. Major changes in our landscape, soils, and hydrology have created conditions less favorable for some aquatic plant species. Second, increased development along the shorelines of Iowa's natural lakes has in some cases fragmented these plant beds. Aquatic plants were, and still are, removed to improve riparian access. Direct removal of plants like hard stem bulrush or shading by docks and hoists fragments their beds and leads to diminished densities. Third on this list is the introduction of invasive species. Invasive species fill in the openings in our environment and can outcompete native species. Sedimentation from the watershed and our lake shores threatens water quality by increasing nutrient load and decreasing water clarity, which can shade out aquatic plants. Sedimentation on the lake bed along shorelines can also accumulate, which hurts sensitive species and favors a few more tolerant plants. 
Boating activity, especially within beds of emergent aquatic plants, can cut and fragment those plants. Although all of these threats are important and should be part of a comprehensive lake and watershed management plan, the project we're discussing in this presentation targets the final concern in the list, the succession or growth of woody vegetation along the shoreline. In fact, the succession and growth of woody vegetation along the shoreline has likely been responsible for the disappearance of many of the species on the historic aquatic plant lists. The nearshore area, often referred to as the wet meadow, is probably the most sensitive part of the shoreline. Um, and historically, the shoreline of Anglers Bay above the waterline would have been dominated by prairie and some locations could have had some scattered low density uh, trees, uh, such as the fire tolerant uh, bur oak. The introduction of more species of trees and shrubs, including some of which have become uh, very invasive, and um, the loss of prairie fires has led to excessive growth of woody species, which has outcompeted and shaded out several native plant species. The brush and trees and shading in this nearshore area uh, really degrades a critical component of our lake's ecosystem. We tend to think of a lake shoreline as a distinct line where the water meets the land. However, historically, this area was much more gradual in transition between the aquatic and terrestrial worlds, where the prairie really did just fade into the lake. Uh, this zone uh, is filled with diverse plants, um, wet soils, and occupied by wildlife, fish, insects, and other organisms that are specifically adapted to living in this area, or really rely on it as part uh, of the habitat needed to complete their life cycle. Species that rely on this transition area to complete their life cycle include several amphibians, fish, reptiles, and insects. State endangered species like the Blanding's turtle and pugnose shiner, and uh, species of conservation need like the northern leopard frog and tiger salamander are all, also found in this zone. Many types of rare insects, such as several species of damsel and dragonflies, also rely on these healthy transitional zones. Moving up and out of the transition zone along the shoreline in Anglers Bay, an early settler would have uh, come upon a prairie oak savanna. Although the landscape of Northwest Iowa was mostly dominated uh, by tall grass prairie without a tree to be seen for miles around, oak savannas could be found uh, along the eastern sides of large lakes and wetlands or on the edges of uh, forested river valleys. Bur oak trees would be partially protected there from spring prairie fires sweeping in from the northwest. This protection provided enough time for those oak trees to become uh, uh, large enough and their bark thick enough to insulate them from occasional fires. Some basswood, hackberry, and a few other species likely existed here in low numbers as well. Oak savannas were maintained by occasional fires and grazing wildlife. As fires became less common and ultimately stopped, our land has, was developed and converted to agriculture and sh a lot of shoreline development. And this unique habitat uh, nearly disappeared, making oak savanna habitat uh, one of the rarest habitat types on the planet. Remnants of this former habitat exist along the shoreline of Anglers Bay today, and this project will attempt to restore much of its look and more importantly, its function. The Iowa DNR forestry personnel inventoried the uh, vegetation and, and trees along the shoreline. And although their official inventory is much more detailed than what you see here, this is a good general overview of the species that were present and where they are occurring. Green ash dominates the stand uh, with the lower densities of native trees present throughout. Uh, there's a number of uh, introduced species um, and also uh, invasive species that dominate the stand, especially in the mid and understory. Plants like buckthorn and garlic mustard are very resilient to management and present a challenge for control going into the future.
95% of the trees present in the project area are green ash. Uh, again, the understory is dominated by buckthorn and garlic mustard, two very aggressive invasive species. This picture represents a typical view of the project site and some of the common species that are found. Although green ash trees have some value, they face a devastating enemy. The invasive uh, emerald ash borer is quickly spreading across the United States. 35 states now report cases, and this insect can kill green ash trees in as little as two years once infected. It is already creating uh, many challenges for homeowners, municipalities, and timber stands uh, across the range of the green ash tree. The emerald ash borer has been found in ash trees as close as Worthington, Minnesota, and once infected, local ash trees will die and uh, obviously have very little value. The good news uh, is that the project site does contain quite a few native trees. Bur oaks, hackberries, and basswoods are found sprinkled throughout the project area, and this aerial photo shows the distribution of these three species in the project area. Uh, these trees will form the basis for the proposed management work, which removes many of the introduced species, uh, harvests, harvests the green ash, and manages the invasive species with a long-term goal of restoring an oak savanna or open woodlot. The forest stewardship and aquatic uh, habitat plan that's been developed uh, provides us some guidance on how this area will be restored to that oak savanna and open woodlot look. Uh, reduction in canopy cover to 40 to 60 percent and aggressive management of invasive species and brush will allow prairie grasses and forbs to flourish. Baroque blight resistant trees will be planted uh, to fill in open areas and replace some of the older trees along with a sprinkling of a few other species. This management plan has the added benefit of reducing shading in the wet meadow and near shore areas, helping to improve the diversity of this critical area right, right on the water's edge. Along with the reduction in shading, uh, some vegetation management strategies and uh, potentially some seeding may be used to encourage plants in that zone. The shoreline area uh, along the entire length will be assessed to make uh, sure that we don't have any excessive erosion uh, occurring in, in uh, vulnerable areas, and we'll try to stabilize those areas when necessary. The green ash in the project site will have some value, and we hope to take advantage of this to reduce the project cost before emerald ash borer becomes a local problem. After restoration, the pres uh, prescribed fire will be used to maintain the oak savanna on into the future. The timeline we're presenting is somewhat aggressive, but we believe the project partner should be able to hit these milestones if we have good working conditions. Year one is already uh, nearly over with several items completed or nearing completion. Uh, the site evaluation and inventory are complete. Uh, the forestry uh, stewardship plan is written and finalized and crews will begin some preliminary site preparations uh, yet this fall. We'll be uh, soon going out for bid for the tree removal portion of the project. And uh, next year, uh, additional work will concentrate on, again, addressing those invasive species uh, with the harvest of, of the trees and removal of, of trees taking place in the early winter after the ground is frozen. Uh, that will help to minimize any soil disturbance from the project. Brush and invasive species management will continue into year three, and depending on how the site is responding, prairie seed will uh, prairie seeding will take place. In year three and four, we'll begin to plant uh, oak trees and uh, a few other species like walnut, basswood, uh, hackberry, bitternut, and hickory throughout the site as determined by the stewardship plan. As mentioned earlier, prescribed fire will be used to maintain the site in the oak uh, savanna state as soon as the fuel load allows burning to occur. Fires will be used on the site about every three to five years to promote the prairie species woody brush and invasive tree, trees from recolonizing. This shoreline on the north side of Center Lake in Dickinson County is an example of aggressive tree and brush management on a natural lake shoreline. Many of the bur oak trees were left on this site and the shoreline was repaired. 
this is the same Center Lake shoreline prior to the project. And as you can see, excessive shading from invasive trees and brush kept uh, beneficial prairie species from growing, uh, which then exposed bare soils underneath of that canopy. And with no protection from wind and wave action uh, or rainfall, uh, the shoreline eroded severely. In many locations on Center Lake, the bank simply collapsed uh, as it became undermined. The Center Lake shoreline shows just how an unmanaged and unprotected shoreline can eventually result in some pretty heavy damage. The, the um, bull rush and cattail beds in front of uh, Anglers Bay uh, shoreline buffer it from some of those large waves, but eventually that shoreline on Spirit Lake could begin to resemble that on, on Center Lakes. In the Center Lake project, the bottom of the bank had to be rebuilt and many of the slopes reestablished. This is an expensive and, and time consuming process and construction had to take place around the healthiest oak trees while all the other trees and shrubs were removed. The density of trees in this photo should provide a, a bit of a vision of what the Angler's Bay shoreline might look like, although the wooded area on Angler's Bay will be much larger. Another example of an oak savanna restoration is on the east and south shorelines of Elk Lake in Clay County. This project is ongoing, but is a good example of the concepts uh, discussed here. Thank you for your interest in this project and spending some time to learn more about these critical natural areas and their unique habitats. The effort needed to restore and maintain them is challenging, but we hope you agree that working on these unique resources is a worthy endeavor. We wish to thank our project partners for committing resources, funding, and support to this project, and we also wish to recognize the many individuals and organizations that came together to make these opportunities possible through the permanent protection of this shoreline. Please direct any questions or comments about this project to one of the three staff members listed on this slide. We'd really enjoy discussing the project with you further. Thank you again.